Section 24 of The Age of the Condottieri by Oscar Browning. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 Pope Julius II, Part 1. Up to the time of his father's death, Cesare Borgia was Lord of Rome. He had money and strong castles, many friends, and eight devoted Spaniards in the sacred college. With these resources, he expected to be able to carry any election he pleased for the papal chair. He told Machiavelli that he had anticipated everything that could possibly happen on his father's death, only that he had not foreseen that at the time he himself might be dangerously ill. As it was, he got possession of the Pope's treasure before the death was made known. Everything else was plundered by the servants. The cardinals were in the greatest embarrassment. A French army under Francesco Gonzaga was on the march from the north. The Orsini and the Colonna might at any moment make an attack upon Rome. Cesare entrenched himself in the Borgo, that portion of Rome which contains St. Peter's and the Vatican, and which is defended by the Tiber and the castle of St. Angelo. He contrived to make a treaty with the Colonna, and so to detach them from their alliance with the Orsini. He also offered to join his army with that of the King of France, to receive in return a guarantee of all his possessions. With the cardinals he made an agreement to leave Rome in three days. Giuliano della Rovere now returned to Rome after an exile of ten years, together with Ascanio Sforza and Cardinal d'Amboise, Archbishop of Rouen, the minister of Louis the Twelfth, At the same time, Jacopo da Piano returned to Piombino, Pandolfo Malatesta to Rimini, and Giovanni Sforza to Pesaro. The French and Spanish armies were both forbidden to enter Rome. The French candidate for the papacy was the Cardinal d'Amboise. The Venetians were in favor of Giuliano della Rovere, who promised to be a good Italian. The requisites for a pope at this time were that he should reform church discipline, should summon a council, and should conduct a crusade against the Turks. The Italians and Spaniards united against a French pope, and preferred to choose an old man who would fill the place for a short time. The votes fell on the Cardinal of Siena, Francesco Todeschini Piccolomini, sixty-four years of age and in bad health. He was proclaimed on September 22nd. Being the nephew of Pius II, he took the title of Pius III. The Venetians had determined to take possession of the Romagna, and conquered Cesena and Faenza without difficulty. Cesare Borgia returned to Rome with a certain number of troops, and received the protection of the Pope, which was not worth much. But the Orsini made peace with the Colonna, and Cesare retired into the castle of St. Angelo, which had been the living tomb of so many of his victims. Pope Pius III, who had been in weak health at the time of his election, and was actually ill on the day of his coronation, died on October 18, 1503. There was no doubt as to his successor. The thirty-six cardinals who entered into conclave chose unanimously Giuliano della Rovere, who took the name of Julius II. He was a most remarkable man, sixty years of age but full of enterprise and energy, more fitted to be a great king than a great priest. During his ten years' exile he had cared more for the interests of France than of Italy. He had stirred up the expedition of Charles VIII into Italy in order to overthrow Alexander VI. He had promised the Spaniards that if he became pope he would make Cesare Borgia standard-bearer of the church. Machiavelli says that the only mistake Cesare ever made was in allowing him to be pope instead of the Cardinal d'Amboise. Julius was not only a soldier of blood and iron, but a great patron of literature and art. For him Bramante worked in St. Peter's, Michelangelo painted the frescoes of the Sistine Chapel, and Raffaele made the apartments of the Vatican glow with color. The attempt to produce a tomb worthy of the great pontiff was the tragedy of Michelangelo's life. 
if the venetians thought that julius would make a compliant pope they were greatly mistaken rimini had already opened its gates to them but the pope bade them abstain from invading the dominions of the church at the same time he refused to confirm cesare borgia in his dukedom and had evidently planned his overthrow cesare embarked on the tiber on november ninth and set sail for ostia his supposed object was to go to tuscany and to implore the assistance of the florentines against the venetians but julius demanded from him the restitution of the romagna in order to save it from venice when cesare refused he was brought back to rome and thrown into prison here he was compelled to humble himself before guido baldo da montefeltro duke of urbino whom he had so ruthlessly driven from his capital in the beginning of the year 1504, he was released from prison on the condition of delivering up his fortresses. Just before this, on December 28, 1503, the French had been seriously defeated by the Spaniards under Consalvo on the banks of the Garigliano. Piero de' Medici was drowned by the swamping of a boat at the mouth of the river. When Cesare found that he could no longer depend upon the French, he turned his attention to their rivals he took refuge with consalvo de cordova at naples the great captain appeared at first to receive him in a friendly manner but afterwards treacherously delivered him to spain he spent two years in confinement at medina del campo and was then allowed to live with his brother-in-law the king of navarre he fell in his service on march twelfth fifteen o seven in a petty conflict with his vassals so perished one who is justly regarded as one of the greatest monsters of an age fruitful in evil characters he was relentlessly cruel and allowed no obstacle to stand in his way yet he was not only admired but loved by those who knew him well machiavelli represents him as the incarnation of political wisdom but we may reasonably doubt whether this wisdom went much beyond a calculating cunning had he been a really great man he would have thrown himself into his dukedom of the romagna and either held it against all comers or perished in the struggle he may have conceived the idea of the unity of italy but greater political wisdom would have shown him that he was not taking the best means to effect this object we have seen that julius the second ascended the papal throne at a great crisis in the history of europe and especially of italy naples was in the hands of spain and milan in those of france and on the rivalries of these two great powers hung the destinies of the peninsula the smaller states were powerless florence was entirely occupied by the war with pisa in 1502 she had entirely changed her constitution by abolishing the rapid succession of magistrates who held office for two months only and electing piero soderini standard-bearer for life perugia siena lucca bologna held their independence only on sufferance julius restored to their possessions those roman barons who had been driven out by the borgia amongst those were the colonna and the orsini the pope also established his nephew francesco maria della rovere as heir to the montefeltri in urbino he also favoured the triple alliance between france spain and the empire concluded at blois on september twenty second fifteen o four by this treaty naples was to pass to the archduke philip and louis the twelfth was to have the investiture of the milanese charles the son of philip was to marry claudia the daughter of the king of france for the moment there was peace in italy with the exception of the war between florence and pisa but a league was made between the pope the emperor the king of france and the archduke philip to recover from the venetians the territories which they had conquered this remained for the moment without practical result under the present condition of europe it was impossible for an energetic sovereign like julius not to desire to imitate in some degree the policy of cesare borgia and to establish a solid temporal princedom in the centre of italy for this purpose it was necessary to extinguish the petty lords who stood in his way and the cities which principally arrested his attention were perugia and bologna he entered perugia as a conqueror 
on August 13, 1506. He then proceeded to Cesena, where on October 1st he published a bull deposing Giovanni Bentivoglio from the government of Bologna, at the same time excommunicating him. Finding that the help of France was given to his rival, the unhappy victim surrendered himself with the promise of life and revenue, and on November 11th, Julius entered Bologna in triumph. He stayed there the whole winter, and on Palm Sunday, March 13th, 1507, he reached Rome, received with every sign of rejoicing which the imagination of the Renaissance could invent. At this time, Ferdinand the Catholic was at Naples. He had heard on his journey of the death of his son-in-law Philip, son of Maximilian, husband of Juana, called the Mad, and father of Charles V. He returned hastily, passed by Ostia without going to Rome to visit the Pope, and landed at Savona, where he met Louis the Twelfth. They remained together for three days, but it is not known what agreement they arrived at. It is supposed that they took into consideration the reform of the Church, the League against Venice, and the fate of Pisa. Venice was at this time occupying some towns in the territory of Lombardy and of Naples, which were claimed by France and Spain. The Pope had determined ever since the moment of his accession to abate the pride and restrain the ambition of the Venetians, by wresting from them the conquests which they had made in the Romagna. At an early period he had created three French cardinals and one Spaniard, the famous Ximenes, in token of his desire to bring the two rival powers into harmony. As early as March 1504, he had sent representatives to the courts of France, Spain, and the Empire to stir them up to an attack upon Venice. At that time, Louis XII and Maximilian were not on terms of intimate friendship, and the emperor is supposed to have favored a plan by which Il Moro should be restored to the throne of Milan, and some addition of territory should be granted to the Swiss. His views on these matters were altered by the death of his son, Philip. The heir to Spain and the empire was his grandson, Charles, a weakly child of seven years old. He wished to secure to him the quiet possession of his inheritance, and one step in that direction was to re-establish the power of Germany and its influence over Italy. Maximilian desired to receive the imperial crown at Rome. He made known his intention of doing so to the imperial diet assembled at Constance in 1507. The Pope was not in favor of this expedition, while France and Venice were strongly opposed to it. Switzerland, in the Diet of Zurich, alone declared its consent. On February 3, 1507, Maximilian was proclaimed in Trent Roman Emperor-elect a title which was afterwards used by his successors as it appeared to relieve the emperors of the necessity of being crowned in Rome. The project of a journey to Rome was given up, and a war was undertaken against the Venetians, who, with the support of France, had refused the emperor a passage through their dominions. Maximilian was everywhere defeated. Gorizia and Trieste were added to the Venetian dominions, and in June 1508, he was, with great reluctance, forced to accept a three years' truce. Venice was at this time in a critical condition. She had by degrees lost her possessions in the east before the advancing Turk, and had only the shreds of her former power left. Her commerce also was passing from her. The discoveries of the Portuguese, the opening of the new route to India, were events destined to carry the course of the world's traffic into other lines. Venice determined to make up by an empire in Italy for what she was losing in the East, and she dreamed that she might be the savior of the peninsula who should bring together state after state in long-desired unity. Had she followed out this design with frank and open magnanimity, it is possible that she might have been able to effect at least a considerable portion of it. But she attempted to gain her ends by conquest, and so roused the determined opposition of powerful enemies. She was then the mistress of great resources. Her fleets had kept the French from Genoa, the Spaniards from Naples. Her army had defended Milan. She lay a bulwark against the invader, 
before the alps of the tyrol and carinthia she was mistress of verona the key to italy to those who entered her by the valley of the adige she possessed brescia bergamo cremona and part of the duchy of milan she also owned friuli which was coveted by austria and some towns on the coast of italy of which spain demanded the restoration in the romagna she held ravenna faenza cervia and rimini she possessed something which every other power wished to have pope julius was especially wroth with the republic of st mark about his territory in the romagna he said one day to the venetian ambassador i will make venice into a fishing village and we replied the envoy will reduce you again to the status of a petty priest if you are not sensible the outcome of all these jealousies was that a league was formed against venice at cambrai on december tenth fifteen o eight the object of which was the destruction of venice and the partition of her possessions besides the gains of the powers already mentioned hungary was to have dalmatia and cyprus was to pass to the house of savoy the league was formed between the emperor france spain and the pope but the latter did not sign it until all hope of gaining the towns in the romagna by other means had been lost the florentines were induced to join it by the promise of pisa the league of cambrai is a serious blot on the reputation of julius the second he consented to invite the great powers of europe as invaders into italy in order that he might recover a few towns of no great importance venice prepared to withstand her enemies with courage the burden of the war fell on louis the twelfth as maximilian was slow in collecting his forces the famous battle of agnadello was fought on may fourteenth fifteen o nine and nearly destroyed the republic it is said that the killed amounted to twenty thousand nearly all venetians peschiera cremona brescia and bergamo fell and the keys of verona vicenza and pavia were delivered to the representatives of the emperor the very completeness of the victory was to a certain extent an advantage for the venetians as it brought into contrast the ambition of louis the twelfth and the sluggishness of maximilian who was not supported by germany when the emperor at last in july reached italy in person he found that an accommodation was already in progress the venetians in their despair offered to the pope and the spaniards the towns which they coveted and when the pope hesitated about granting peace talked of appealing to the turks julius thundered with his bulls on the other side in the din of the conflict pisa after a long resistance surrendered itself to the florentines venice was saved by the jealousy of the allies who were opposed to her and by the slowness of the emperor maximilian was driven back from the walls of padua the pope began to be more disposed toward peace he said to the venetian ambassadors if venice ceased to exist we should have to create another he came to terms in february fifteen ten the venetian ambassadors received solemn absolution as the florentines had received it from sextus the fourth the ceremony took place in st peter's on the second sunday in lent february twenty fourth fifteen ten end of section twenty four